or Ida Rowe on the go, welcoming you to our new hangout called um, Book Bookkeeping for Tax Professionals. I'm glad to see, see nobody here. Okay. Hold on just a minute. Okay. While we're waiting for viewers to come in, I'm just going to do some talking and we'll see what happens. I want to welcome you to Tax Professionals and Other Interested for Tax Professionals and Other Interested Persons. This is a Google Hangout on air that will meet once a week for eight weeks. During that time, when we are going to be talking about bookkeeping, you see two different modes. The first will be Google Sheets, similar to Excel, but with the ability to share information. And the second is an introduction to Xero. The beautiful software. The purpose is to help tax professionals with self-employed clients. We're not trying to make tax professionals bookkeepers, although many of us are. We are trying to help them share with their clients some ways that they can provide their business information so that they can meet the requirements of the IRS and present their tax information in an accurate method. I am Ida Rowe on the go. I will be the instructor and flight leader for this class. I have been a tax professional for over 15 years. I have also been an enrolled agent. I can represent a taxpayer in front of the IRS. I have also taught classes for taxes for over 15 years, plus a bunch of other classes. Uh, in addition, I have bookkeeping experience from hands-on to the computer. Educationally, I have a BA in social work an MS in adult education, I'm a QuickBooks Pro Advisor and an advisor with zero. Over the years I've worked with a variety of businesses, getting experience in construction, real estate, insurance, the aircraft industry, a mail order business, and an employment agency, just to name a few. Okay, if there was anyone here, I was going to talk about um, how things work. Uh, one of the things that I can do is and we're going to be using it. Um, we're going to go to the timeshare, uh, the share screen. Uh, this is chat. So if you have any questions or anything like that, we can chat. Um, question and answers. If you've it's been turned on, so if you have any questions, you can uh, type them in. Uh, this is a cameraman. This is a control room. That's Google Drive. And that's YouTube. This it will be available also on YouTube. So that afterwards or when you're in between classes, if you want to review something, you can go and view it on YouTube, which I think is very exciting. Um, okay. Before we get into the discussion of bookkeeping, I want to review the Schedule C and some expectations for completing the form. I'm doing this because basically we're going to talk about people who are Schedule C self-employed people. Um, it may apply also to people with other kinds of businesses like an LLC or a partnership or a corporation, but we're going to focus on self-employed people because basically that's what a lot of our tax professionals who do individual returns work with people who are self-employed. Um, and it's important that we help them because many times they're the ones that really don't know for sure how they should do things and this just kind of helps them get to the point where they can do it. A little bit better, a little bit easier, they come into you with all the information and you don't have the hassle of trying to pull things off the screen. Um, so this is going to put us on the same page as we talk about bookkeeping. The purpose of the course is not to make you a bookkeeper but to help you, help your client so that the next time you do your, your ta you do their taxes, you have a mutual understanding of what is expected of them. In my 15 years or so of tax preparation, I am amazed at how many answers the taxpayer finds to the tax in the tile ceilings. You ask them a question: How much did you pay for insurance? Well, ah, there it is. I paid 125 dollars. 
okay, did they really do that? Did they remember it? You know, maybe they did. Or maybe they're just making it up. We don't know. And it's up to us to try to discern if they're making it up. They really need to go and get the right information. Um, our goal is an accurate representation of their business. Yes, there is some wiggle room. Even the federal government allows you to do some um, wiggling. Um, adjustments and this kind of thing. But we really want to get as close as we can to the correct amounts. So let's start talking about what the government expects of business owners. It will probably not surprise you to hear that the government expects them to actually keep records, preferably good records. What does that mean? First of all, they need to keep a record of their income. How much did we invest in our own money in the business? We're starting a business. We have to put some money in so that we can get an office maybe or other things uh, so we can get set up to do what we need to do. And there are a lot of people that start out in business and self-employed people with a limited amount of funds and um, they're, they're trying to put everything together as reasonable as they can. Uh, do we get any loans? Uh, how much money do we actually earn? And this includes cash, check, credit card, and barter income. Legal or illegal income, over the table or under the table income. In publication 17, which is the IRS publication um, for individual returns, it mentions, it even mentions income from drug sales and embezzlement. We hope your clients are never audited. But if they are audited, one of the terms that the IRS asks for, one of the thing, items that the IRS asks for, is your bank records for the year. So that they can actually add to the, up the amount of money the taxpayer puts to the bank accounts. They look at what they said they made compared with what they put into their account. Now if there's a discrepancy, the money they put into the account was more than they claimed, then they want to know where did that money come from. Was it a loan? You know, uh, did you put your own money in? Where did that money come from? And yes, if they do deal in cash, the taxpayer needs to make sure that they account for it. When it comes to income, there is no free money where the IRS is concerned. In fact, the definition of taxable income is all worldwide income that is not specifically defined as non-taxable, regardless of the source, legal or illegal, over the table or under the table. And today, a lot of people are international currencies. So the money that you earn from someone in Japan or England or Australia or uh, New Zealand or wherever uh, is part of that income. It's all worldwide income. The other thing the government wants us to look at is to keep track of their expenses. In reality, they want I see I have a viewer. Thank you very much, but I don't see your picture on there. That's okay. Um, is there anything here? Okay. Give me just a minute because I lost my place. Right. We need to keep track of our expenses. In reality, they want them to treat their business as a business. Gee, that's funny. It's a business. You're supposed to treat it as a business, right? Not everyone does that. And if you don't, then the government can come in and they can look at it and they say, hmm, you haven't been doing this, this, and this. You don't spend the time in it that you should, according to the, according to the, the things. You're not spending the number, number of hours and everything. Um, this is not a business. This is a hobby. Therefore, you declare the income and you can take expenses up to the amount of your income, subject to 2%. So you want to make sure if you're doing a business, it really is a business. If you're not sure what's going to be, start it out as a, as a hobby. You just have to declare the income. You don't have to keep quite the records that you did as a business. And then you find that it's really going to go. Then you can turn it into a business. Um, if it's selling something that obviously is a business, and you really can't do that. But there are some things, you know, if you're a crafter or something like that, 
you know, the craft shows and this kind of thing, is it a hobby or is it an actual business? Are you actually making money? Um, it's a little scary when you think, uh, when it comes to spending, there's a phrase that is in the IRS documents, which, by the way, only serve as guidelines and are not actually the law. It's scary, isn't it? The term is ordinary and necessary. What expenses are ordinary and necessary to their particular business? Do they need to spend? Uh, what do they need to spend in order to make money? And is this generally what the other persons in your business are spending? The government actually has records of what people in various um, occupations, businesses spend, and they will look at what you've written down. And they'll look at what's ordinary and necessary. And if you have something that's way out there, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, you know, we need to look at this. It doesn't make sense. And you may be able to defend yourself and say, this is ordinary and necessary for my business because whatever. Um, but you need to make sure it's ordinary and necessary. Now, business, here comes the rub. Business owners all talk to others in their business. They get an idea of how they're going about it, what they uh, spend, etc. But are they telling everyone everything they need to know? Or are they just telling them whatever happens to pop up? And they're not going to give them everything because they don't really want to. And number two, do you really think when you're talking to someone about something, do you really think of everything you need to say? Probably not. Last year, I handled an audit for a young man, not long out of college. He was an actor, and over the summer, had served as the manager for a friend who was on a tour of five or six cities from around the country. He was called in for an audit. Imagine that, his first attempt at this, and he gets called in for an audit. Let's wake up. Many people do it for years, and all of a sudden, they get called in for an audit, and then they find out they have to do some changes. His was the very first time. Now, he had most of his receipts, but not all. More importantly, he was missing some important pieces of information. For example, at each of the venues, they used roadies, temporary stagehands, to help in uh, tearing, setting up and tearing down the steps. OK, they go in, they hire these roadies. He did not get a receipt. Uh, for them when he gave them the cash, nor did he get a contract from them. Guess what the IRS wanted? They wanted a receipt for when they paid them the money, and they wanted a contract. Guess what? That expense, that $5,000 expense, got set aside because he didn't have the information that he needed. Most of the rest of the stuff he was okay with because he had the information that he needed or the auditor was just being nice. Except, however, he had an additional $4,000 in his checking account, his business checking account, that he needed to be able to explain because it did not match his income. You've got to be careful about those things. Um, So he ended up having to pay as a result of his audit. And the last time I talked to him, he said that uh, he was making sure that he kept the receipts and everything to make sure that he had everything in case he got audited again. He probably never will, but he's learned an important lesson. Now, how many of you have heard about the old shoebox full of receipts? Or the shopping bags? Or the really big boxes? They come with these huge boxes. You think, oh my gosh. And sometimes they're really well organized. And that's good because the person is taking the time to put them in the boxes in an orderly fashion. And they know the information. On uh, the other one, someone says, you do my tax return and here's the information. Uh-uh, doesn't work that way. Um, tax professionals are not bookkeepers. Even though they may be a bookkeeper for doing the taxes, they're not the bookkeeper. Uh, there are really better ways of doing things. Uh, not everyone needs a bookkeeper or a full-time employee to do the books, but everyone does need to have a plan, and as their business grows, to evaluate that plan. You can start out using Excel or Google, Google Sheets, 
and then move to another kind of software like uh, QuickBooks or Zero or some of the others that are out there. Um, and then when you get bigger still, then you know there's there's other uh, software programs that you can move up to. So when I talk to my clients, I suggest three things to them. Number one, if you don't have one, you need to get a separate business account for their business. If need be, let it be a separate personal account, depending on what the bank is charges. Then they can put all of their business income into a separate checking account. Each month, they add the receipts in the process to get their income. And by the way, that includes cash as well. So you need to make sure that you put the cash into the bank, or at least record it in some way. Um, many businesses have merchant accounts so they can handle the credit cards, checks, and some even have PayPal as a means of collecting money. Yes, there are expenses with them, but that falls within the category of ordinary and necessary. I have the petty cash fund for my business as well. I keep it low, but it's for those small expenditures like postage, parking meters, a few incidentals where you either cannot or do not want to charge. They should have a record of these expenses and reconcile them on a regular basis. If they have a business credit card, let that be the method of keeping track of your expenses. Receipts are, are still needed, but you can keep track of them of what the receipts were for. Um, one of the things that I do on my receipts is um, I scan them. I keep the receipts still, and if it's for a meal expense or whatever, I put who I went with and the reason for it, um, because that's what the government wants. If it's a group of friends going out for dinner, that's not a business expense, and you can't take it. But if there's a business reason, then you can. Are you traveling? You're away from home. You're traveling for business, and you need to eat a meal out, so you put business trip or whatever on it, um, and it helps. Um, how many of you have gotten those thermal receipts in a couple of weeks after you've gotten them? You go to look at them because you want some information off of it, and they're gone. They don't last. Well, if you get those thermal receipts and make a copy of them, scan them, then you've got it. Um, modern technology is wonderful. I love it. The cell phones and scanners, copies of receipts can be made, and there they are in one handy storage container, our cell phone or our computer. And by the way, if they get audited, the IRS allows these copies if they do not have the original receipts. It is not advisable to throw these receipts away. The originals should be kept where they can easily be retrieved if there is an audit. I was listening to someone talk um, at a conference that I was listening to on a, over the internet, and she said, I just scan everything and I throw my receipts away. That's really not what the IRS wants you to do. They want you to be able to hold on to those receipts, especially if they're meal receipts, hotel receipts, and this kind of thing. So there is a question they can look. Many of the people I work with are in the entertainment industry. They have people telling them what they can take as expenses. However, if a person makes $15,000 in acting and they have ordinary necessary expenses, can they have ordinary expenses, necessary expenses? They're the same as a person making $100,000 a year or more. Probably not. What is ordinary and necessary has to take into consideration what you are currently making. The, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I would be remiss in doing my job if I didn't share the information I know with my clients. You come to a tax professional for information and knowledge, yet many taxpayers have heard that you can take your hair, your clothes, your cleaning, all the movies you attend, etc. Guess again. There needs to be a business reason for doing something. And the IRS, for example, is, is looks at things, and over the course of time, they will come down and they will say, you can't take all the movies, but if you were told that you needed to go see a certain movie, or you had to do it because of a part that you got, if you got the part, and you've seen that movie because of the part, then you can take the movie. If you're just going to the movie because you're in the industry and you want to learn about your craft, that's not going to take credit for them. It has to be a business reason. 
learning about your craft is nice, but why are you in the business? Because you like movies, so you have to be careful what you're doing. Um, one of my favorite lines is, no, you can't take your clothing as a deduction. After all, all of us wear clothing as a part of our life, and that generally reflects our jobs. If an article of clothing is worn on the street, then it is not a business expense. I also suggest that if it's a part of a costume, they either go to a thrift store to get it or try to rent it, rent the item. After all, rental is deductible. A purchase is not. For example, one of my clients was an on-air personality. He bought nice suits, had them dry cleaned, until he was called in for an audit. The purpose of the audit was had nothing to do with his business, but something his wife had done. In the course of the audit, it came out and those expenses were denied. And he ended up having to pay the government some money. Today, when I do a person's return, I scan their paperwork and put it in with the return. I use the neat software, and there's a lot of others out there. I'm, I'm not recommending any, although I do like it. But there, there's a lot out there, and you have to find one that works for you. Um, I've got a small business, so I don't need big equipment. So this works really nicely. I travel to do my returns. So I can take it with me and I just scan it while I'm there, put it on my computer, I've got it ready to go. Uh, okay. I don't hold on to millions of pieces of paper. I can store a copy on my computer and one in the cloud. I have I had a computer crash on me last year. Unfortunately I had an external hard drive, with most of the uh, everything backed up. I highly recommend you do the same because the things that you need more are generally the most recently done. You do need to back up with some regularity. I also use a thumb drive to back up for different projects. Well, I'm a bookkeeper and use QuickBooks and Zero for my business clients. There are other applications out there. If you're just beginning, start with Excel or a similar application. The key is to develop consistency. You need to keep track of your income and your expenses. As a business owner, you have a lot of other things that need your attention. My recommendation is to begin to schedule once a week and budget time for working with your books. The end of the month, total your income expenses according to the category and roll them into another spreadsheet that will add everything up for the year. And this is something we're going to be going over the next three weeks with using Excel uh, or Google+. Some, um, you can do it or someone can do it for you. If you don't have the time or you don't have the skills, you can pay someone to do that. Uh, the time for getting started for getting rid of your next tax season is today, not the end of the year. By keeping track of your expenses, you also determine if they are indeed ordinary and necessary. Or if perhaps there is are there many more than what you are making. Because you don't really want to go into you don't sometimes you have to go into debt, but you really need to try to stay so that you've got a profit at the end of the year. Yes, in startup that often occurs when you end up spending more than what you made. But you need to keep that in mind. The government says you have a, uh, a loss in two of the five years. Uh, you can have a loss in two of the five years, but you also need to show that you are treating your business as a business. And that includes monitoring your expenses. Now, many, in office, many people have an office and home. Uh, they're working out of their home, they're starting out, and they've got this little portion of, of their office, of, of their home, that they are using. And the question here is, is it regularly and exclusively used for business? That means that they don't come into their computer and play games on it, and then get started into whatever business. It also means that um, they don't let the kids do the homework in their office. The kids should have their own computer, if that's possible, and their own place to work so that they can set starting to study habits. And in this year, one of the things that has happened is the government has said we're giving you a choice. It actually affects people who have used their home in the past. You figure the expenses for the home, you used a portion of the mortgage interest and the real estate taxes, the utilities and depreciation to come up with the amount. This year there's a second way. Is called the new simplified method. The IRS now provides a simplified method to determine your expenses for business use of your home. The simplified method is an alternative to calculating and 
sustaining actual expenses. In most cases, you will figure your deduction rate multiplying five dollars times the area of your home used as a qualified business. The area up to one hundred and up to three hundred dollars, three hundred square feet, which is fifteen hundred dollars a year. Um, and it, you can, if you have wanted more instructions on that, it's in Schedule C or Publication five eighty seven or Publication three thirty four. It's really nice because then you don't have to depreciate your home that year. If you if you own a home and you're depreciating your home, then you don't have to do that, and you take all of your expenses on the schedule for the mortgage and all that on the home on the Schedule A, so that uh, it's not subject. Uh, okay, and that makes it a lot easier. Uh, however, if you get it's better to do it the other way, then you go ahead and you do it the other way. It just depends on what your percentages are at home. Um, and theoretically, you do need to go and you need to measure out. My square footage of my home is 10,000 square feet, and my office space is 100 square feet, or whatever it is. Um, when you do use the simplify method, you don't have to figure mortgage interest, rent, utilities, insurance, or other expenses. If you're a homeowner, the mortgage interest goes in schedule rate, which I just said. And you don't need to determine depreciation. And the good news is right now you can switch back and forth. Uh, keep in mind regular uh, and exclusive use still applies no matter which methods you use. And I'm going to say one more thing about mileage. How many of you get your oil change the first of every year in January? Well, if you have, if you're doing mileage, it's a good thing in January to you get your mileage, your oil changed. Because what do they do when they change your oil? They put down the amount of uh, the car mileage. So then you have a record that is written by another person, and the government looks at that and they say, okay, we're going to leave this. Um, you can also take a picture with yourself on the first day of the year and label it starting mileage. I did that last year. Um, keep in mind that you have to distinguish between commuting and business mileage. It's not how many miles you drove all together, but you have to have that amount, total mileage for the year, and then the mileage that you spent going from business to business to business. And unless you have an office and home, the first stop is you, you, it doesn't start from home, it starts from your first stop. And one of the things I recommend is you get a post office box really close to your uh, to your home and you stop that and you make that your first stop. And then everything else is business knowledge. Um, you can use the mileage on your odometer. You can use MapQuest or GPS to determine the mileage. And the important thing is to write it down on a regular basis, depending on the mileage, amount of mileage you use. If you generally go to the same places all the time, let's say you're a route salesperson, and you go to the same places all the time, you try to keep track of your mileage for six months, and then you can figure the uh, figure for the rest of the month based upon that. So this is one of the little fudge factors that the government lets you do, so that you don't have to keep track of the mileage all the time. Um, and it's really easy if you have it in your, in your purse, if you have a calendar. Um, and if you ever get audited, you do not want to go into the audit with the calendar that you've made with the same pen, the same handwriting, the same color pen and everything for the year because you know what they're going to they really know. So you want to make it as if it, you, and it needs to be contiguous. <sighs> Also, there are apps for your cell phone that can allow you to record your mileage as you go. TaxBuck is one of the apps that I have online, and it help you you can help you find the tax professional in your area, and it also helps you keep track of mileage and expenses to share with your tax professional or when you for your clients to share with you. Now, there are two types of of mileage, automobile expenses: standard mileage. Is using the business miles and taking us the rate set by the U.S. government. Currently, it is 56 cents a mile. The other is actual. With actual, you need to keep track of your. You still have to keep track of your total business miles. Either way, 
but you also keep track of all of your car expenses, including gas, oil changes, repairs, car washes, insurance, and if you own your own business and have a loan in your car, you can also deduct the business portion of the interest payment made on the car, whichever method you use. And you can get this information from your lien holder. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about bookkeeping in the short, so we are going to have a short session today. According to Wikipedia, bookkeeping in business is a reporting of financial transactions and is a part of the process of accounting. Transactions include purchases, sales, receipts, and payments by an individual or organization. The accountant creates reports from the recorded financial transactions recorded by the bookkeeper and files forms with government agencies. And there are some common methods of bookkeeping, such as single entry bookkeeping system and double entry bookkeeping system. And while these systems have been seen as real bookkeeping, any process that involves the recording of financial transactions is a bookkeeping process. Bookkeeping is usually performed by a bookkeeper. A bookkeeper is also known as accounting clerk or accounting technician as is a person who records the day-to-day -day financial transactions of an organization. A bookkeeper is usually responsible for writing the day books. Day books consist of purchases, sales, receipts, and payments. The bookkeeper is responsible for ensuring all transactions are recorded in the correct day book, supplier's ledger, customer ledger, and general ledger. The bookkeeper brings the books into a trial balance stage and the accountant then prepares the income and balance statements using the trial balance and the ledgers prepared by the bookkeeper. In, our, in, in the sessions going forward, we're going to be looking at especially the profit and loss, the um, balance sheet, the income statement, and see how it, how it puts together so that when we get this information, then we're able to, to better do a tax return for a client because we have all the information that we need. Um, and in other words, we use bookkeeping to pull together the numerical data of a company in order to present a financial picture. We're actually doing the number picture. If the business is doing well, there's a profit. If, on the other hand, it is doing poorly, for, you know, whatever, for whatever matter reason, it is likely to be a loss. In fact, most businesses that are started do not last beyond the second or third year. It's hard to stay in business for six or seven years. And when you do that, you're really doing well. Uh, in the beginning section, we stated that the U.S. government, the IRS, expects us to keep records. We need to be able to identify our income, our expenses, money we put into the business, our equity, our fixed assets, along with all the other information that can affect the financial picture of the business. Not only does the tax IRS expect us to keep records, we go for loan. The bank expects the IRS business owners to not only have the records, but to meet all the other criteria, such as a business license, paid up taxes. If you're in the business for two years and you haven't paid up taxes, the government, the bank probably doesn't want to loan you any money until you get those taxes paid. And now the government is saying if you haven't filed your taxes and you owe the government money, you can't get an extension, you can't um, do payments uh, until you get all those tax returns in because they want to know how much you really owe. So they're kind of cra cracking down on us. For the purpose of this course, we're going to look at core components. They include the chart of accounts the balance sheet, the profit and loss statements, as well as, as the primary reports. The first, time, the first half, we're going to look at Google Sheets. It's a method of keeping track of income and expenses. It's very simple and it's used especially, it's especially successful for people who have small businesses. They're just getting started. They really don't know for sure what they want to do for their accounting. They know that they need to have certain information. They don't know what all of it is. They maybe haven't quite determined what they want for their chart of accounts. Um, 
even though they know what they're doing. So they want to start small. And then they get to going and they suddenly realize that they have reached that point where they need to move to the next step and get a bookkeeping system. And then it's really easy to take that and transfer it to the bookkeeping system. Um, the second half of the class, we will be looking at Zero, the beautiful software. This is a computerized software that is online and developed in New Zealand. They will now be spreading around the world and have a corporate office in San Francisco. Again, the purpose of the class is to help you and your clients in determining how they want to keep track of their information. Okay, now this is the end of my presentation for today. The Google Hangout Plus Hangout is free. I'm developing handouts that go with each class. The total cost of the handout is $100, and this includes the first free session with me as well. If you're interested in getting the handouts, email at idarow.com on the go at gmail.com with your email address and I'll send you the invoice and you can pay either online or you can uh, go to my PayPal account at either on the go at gmail.com and pay there or you can send me a check. So if you have any questions you can also call me at 818-627-0525. I thank you for watching and hope to see you next week when we talk about uh, the beginning of uh, what goes into making your uh, putting together your books. Okay? Have a great weekend.